quietly. We have about 40 high school students, I think, that are trying to get here today to join us uh, on a field trip. I have only one or two announcements, and then I'll introduce today's um, guest presenter. First of all, uh, the spring break uh, trip, I have one or two students ask me if they could get that information. I have some of that with me. If you didn't already get that information, please take a moment to see me after class. And second item, your grades that you have earned through uh, week six, so not through the week that you just completed last night, but the week prior to that, are um, in your inbox as of about 15 minutes ago. So you'll want to pull that up and review. It's a spreadsheet. You'll find your badger ID number, follow across to see what your percent is, and you'll be able to see what my records show that you have earned so far. The reason I do that is one, because the Canvas system for this particular class, this combined section of classes, is not um, a good reflection. It's not easy to use. The grades it shows that you have earned are actually accurate. But just putting it all together and really understanding where you stand isn't easy in that system. So, so look at that. That's one of the reasons I did it. The second reason is because if, if there are any discrepancies or if you're really falling down, this kind of can be an eye opener and you can look at it and say, oh my goodness, I'm getting 40% and come and see me. Most of you are doing very well in the class. So um, with that, it's my privilege today to introduce Peggy Ince Whiting. She has come to us from Salt Lake City to present today about her story of starting, and she's been involved in a few uh, very successful entrepreneurial ventures. Some of you may have heard of and remember or know about a restaurant called Ichiban Sushi. Peggy Whiting was trained by a master chef, uh, sushi chef in Japan, Master Inoue and brought that skill and talent and passion here uh, for a couple of decades, operated that restaurant very successfully. And today, uh, she has moved on and uh, today she has what you saw on the table out here, a very successful line and very delicious line. I can tell you because it's one of, it is my favorite, absolute top of the list, very favorite teriyaki sauce ever that I've tasted. And, and I lived in Japan for two years and I've tasted a lot of them. So there is my plug for her product. If you like them, you cannot go wrong with, with Sil Soma. So with that, if you'll give a warm welcome to Mrs. Peggy in Spidey. Let's make sure the microphone's on, everybody can hear? We're good? Okay. Um, you know, if, if any of you, yes, I'm a sushi chef. And if most of you throughout my career, they look at me and go, you're not Japanese, you're a woman. And that is true, it's very odd. So how does a Caucasian woman, Utah born farm girl, end up being the first female to work behind a sushi bar in Japan? It's kind of a big stretch and you wouldn't believe the path that got me there. So I started working in, in Japanese restaurants back in high school. My, be my best friend in high school was Japanese American and they owned a, a, a Jap the first Japanese restaurant in Salt Lake. Asked me to help one night and there I was doing a part-time job, put my way through high school, got to hang with my friends, it was all good, and continued to college at the University of Utah. While I was there, I continued cooking as a way to put my way through, through school, but I had no intention of continue cooking. I was a journalism major. I wanted to like watch out Barbara Walters. I was going <laughs> to do some radio, television, and film. But as I was working at a Japanese restaurant, the sushi chef lost his visa. And I was always hidden in the back doing the tempura and the cooking on the grill. And these, the restaurant owners came to me and said, well, would you like to learn how to make sushi? I was like, well, that's kind of an interesting opportunity. I could do that for a year, right? I could, I could do something new for a year. This is my fourth year. I was a senior in college. How do you make that kind of decision to leave college to do sushi for a year? But I kind of thought that's kind of one of the key points. Sometimes opportunities come along that you have to listen to, even though they may not make sense right away. So I decided to go ahead and learn sushi and thought I would do it for one year. And that was over 30 years ago. And here I am still making sushi, right? So um, I ran that sushi bar for four years. 
And um, at that time, it was the early 80s. It was the early 80s, and there was very few sushi bars in, in Salt Lake. And I had some very regular Japanese customers because there was only three sushi bars or three or four handful of sushi bars in Salt Lake. And they came in one day and said, you know, you should really go and work in Japan. And I said, uh, like anybody would take me? And I started putting the same doubts on myself that everybody else had labeled me. You're white, you're a woman, there's no way. And traditionally, women don't make sushi in Japan because our hands are three degrees warmer than men which, oh, affects the taste of the fish, apparently. <laughs> and our hands are not strong enough to form the rice properly. Well, you start thinking about that, and it's like, well, that worked for how many hundreds of years and kept women out of that field? But when I um, proposed, and they, they made that offer, and they learned the reason women don't make sushi, and I talked, we had a homeschool student at the time, or an exchange student living in our house from Japan, and she was this hip, wild, crazy 17-year-old high school student, and I asked her what she thought of that idea. And she's like, you can't. Women don't make sushi. And it's like, that just inspired me to want to do it more. So when this Japanese cu customers came back the next week and said, I have a job for you, I will introduce you to Master Eno. And I decided to take the chance. I sold my car, put my, my, all my apartment in storage, bought a ticket to Tokyo, and off I went. It's another example of those opportunities that come along that sometimes you just have to listen to, even though they might be scary. I was sitting on the plane, tapping my foot and nervous as hell, right, <laughs> to, to go and, and face this world that wasn't supposedly supposed to happen. But then um, I, I was introduced, the Japanese business, businessman met me there and introduced me to the sushi master. And the master, you know, was always very kind and very gracious. He wanted to be in good with this business consortium, but, and so he said yes. It was just I was in the middle of a very good business association. So, but, and so the master, so the, I took this advice from these businessmen that it would be a good idea and they could help me arrange it to go and work in Japan. And then I started working, but my sushi master had two different sushi bars. One was in downtown right in the... Um, in the area of Tokyo that was with all the embassies and all the, the international businessmen. So he wanted me there most of the time with all the international people. But he also had a sushi bar over in the high, in Akasaka, in, that, in the entertainment district, where all the geishas and all of the entertainment happened. So when he would leave to go to the other shop, I was left there with the other chefs. And then it would start. And the other chefs would go, you go clean the bathroom. That's what women are supposed to do. You go vacuum the floor. That's what women are supposed to do. And I would do what I was told. I would vacuum the floor. But as I vacuumed the floor, because I wouldn't be disobedient, I would yell over the, I know how to vacuum a floor. I already learned how to vacuum the floor. That's not why I came. And of course, they're not really used to kind of outspoken women. So <laughs> eventually, they were just taken aback. But I still was doing what I was told, so I wasn't being disrespectful that way, but I wanted to let them know my opinion on that. After a few, after about three weeks, I was just another chef. I was just another one behind the bar cutting fish, and there was only one or two times when the issue came up, and that's when, it, in the sushi bar I worked at, we had a big aquarium behind us, where the customers would point at the fish, and we would fillet the fish live, and serve ikizukuri, where the fish would still be breathing while you ate it, right? So the first time that it was my turn to fillet one of the live fish, I'm like, she's going to scream, she's going to scream. And they were laying odds on, on how much I was going to react to the fish flopping on the cutting board, right? So that was one of the few times that I had to just and not scream and not squeal and just fillet the fish. So um, I worked in Japan. I was there for, I worked there for over a year, working at a sushi bar in Japan. And I just became, like I said, one of the other chefs. And they became, we all went out for to sing karaoke after, I was just another chef. So I came back home from Tokyo um, and opened up Ichiban Sushi. When I made it, so here's where we get into the, how do you decide to open up a business? Well, I had been serving sushi in Salt Lake and most of my customers, uh, before I went to Japan, were from Park City. Park City was full of people that were transplants from California, 
or that worked for Delta Airlines that had that pallet. So I made the decision right from Tokyo. I came back home where I wanted to do what I liked to do, where I wanted to do it. So I opened up a sushi bar in Park City. Now, I didn't start with a great big, huge sushi bar. That's one of the key points when you're opening a new business, is you don't want to go into debt too fast. You don't want to go so big that you don't, you don't get these glorious plans in your hands to go great big, huge, and go big, but you have to find a niche of, of something that people want. So sushi was something that people wanted, but I opened up, I found a location that it was one of the original bars in Park City, so it had a great big, huge kitchen in the basement. And the basement wasn't being used, but the main floor was a clothing shop. So I was kind of like a speakeasy, kind of weird little restaurant, right? You walked in, and there was fur coats and jewelry, and, the, and then you had to go downstairs, and then you were at a restaurant. So my very first location at Ichiban Sushi sat 30 people. It was 10 chairs at the sushi bar and like five tables. Very small. I had myself and one other helper chef. And within two and a half years, by the two year mark, it was an hour and a half waiting line to get in. People would be shopping in upstairs in the clothing shop, pacing outside on Main Street, waiting to get in. So I made the decision to move down the street and I moved upstairs. So instead of the basement in, a, in, in Park City, I was on the third level in Park City and I moved to a 50 chair, so I kind of almost doubled my space. But then I bought a little bit of small equipment, right? So then I'd already been in business for two and a half years, but I bought used equipment and subleased from another restaurant for the top floor that they weren't using and, and kept the, moved the sushi bar and had more tables. So I got a little bit bigger. And you know what happened? Two years later, it was another hour and a half waiting line. <laughs> So then I, I made the move down, park, down Main Street a little bit more and bought a building and was on the main level in Park City. And then I sat, sat 85 people. So you can see I just gradually grew as my skills grew because even though I knew how to make sushi, that doesn't necessarily mean you had to handle the masses, right? I mean, because each, each time you have a customer growth, there's a whole lot of orders coming out on the printer that you're trying to deal with. So, I moved into, so my next location was 85, and I doubled the size of the sushi bar, so now it was 20 chairs at the sushi bar. And by this time, because I'd been in business for five years, I had all these apprentices that I had taught, right? So that I had helpers that I had taught and worked up. So I built the business slowly and had people that then were trained to make sushi as well, which I couldn't have jumped into that you wouldn't have had the people trained. There weren't that many sushi chefs hanging around Salt Lake. So you had, I trained them up. So then by then, by five years later, I had a staff that could handle 85 chairs, which was great. I was happy. It was a busy restaurant. We had all kinds of accolades from, from anything you can imagine, <laughs> from the top 100 restaurants in the nation to, uh, to fine dining, to gourmet, to all of these, I have, have acknowledged Ichiban Sushi as one of the great sushi bars. And then it was announced that Utah and Park City and Salt Lake was going to host the Olympics. So someone walked in off the street and offered me four times what I had paid for that real estate. You have a successful business, it's running well, four times is kind of a lot of money to think that it's ever going to go past that. Right. So I made the decision to sell the real estate and move yet again. So I'm kind of the roving restaurant. Nobody moves the restaurant. I did four times. So I sold that real estate and bought a big old cathedral down in Salt Lake. So I was still open for the Olympics. I was just in Salt Lake instead of Park City. Well, this time, of course, the bankers thought I was crazy. Right. I mean, you're 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 leaving your customers. You're starting brand new. It's like. But it wasn't the case. The customers would come in on their way to the airport, were on their way to the jazz game. I still, I just built the customer base. So when I moved the restaurant down to Salt Lake City, I now sat 190. It's huge. It's a big restaurant with a lot of employees and a lot of craziness and a huge remodel of this beautiful cathedral. But it worked. And we were busy. And it was wonderful. And we had, I mean, every night I had five or six chefs working with me. I mean, it was a busy, busy restaurant. So 
some of those points of building and, and becoming an option and building is like following your gut and making decisions when opportunities arise, but not getting too much in debt, not jumping off the edge. You can build up slowly to become a huge 190 chair restaurant within five years or six years or however long it was. So I, but I had owned, so Park City, I was open in Park City for 12 years and then moved to Salt Lake and I had owned Ichiban Sushi for 18 years. It was just a great long run for a restaurant. It was a very successful, busy restaurant. But it became the time, I mean, at that time I was a, a young mom, and my kids were young, and it was kind of perfect because I was only open for dinner. I never opened for lunch. So I was only open for dinner, so I was home with my kids in the day, and then um, I would go to work at three, didn't miss that much of the night time, and go, to, go be a chef at night. I was a little sleep deprived, but still could make it work. But when my youngest went to, high, to, went to first grade, went to, then things changed for me because now I no longer saw my children. They, went, they, got, they got off school at 3 o'clock when I was on my way to work. So I saw them for like an hour in the morning, which wasn't really enough. So I made the decision to sell, to sell them at the restaurant. And it was kind of like having your high, your child go off to, to college. I mean, at eight years, I, that was my life for 18 years of being a chef every day. And it was, it was I was sad and happy. And so when I sold, I thought, well, th this is great. Now I'll be home with my kids. So, and, you know, and it was a great opportunity for, I did all the field trips, I did all the homeschool, I did all the reading groups. But within a year of being home, I still wanted to work a little bit, and that's when people would call and say, can you make me a jar of teriyaki sauce? And that's when I decided to start bottling my teriyaki sauce. That was something I could do on my own time frame. It's not like the restaurant business where you're locked into this, this work hours, these times. When you own your own business, it's in, a, in a, that kind of sense where you can go and talk to grocery stores when the kids are at school or when they're not. You can adjust your time and your work level. But I had the disadvantage of, I know, I know the restaurant business, that's what I've done for 20 years. I know how to make teriyaki sauce, I've made teriyaki sauce for 30 years, but how do you go about bottling it, getting the labels, getting the barcodes, getting all of the stuff that goes with packaging, and then marketing it and selling the teriyaki sauce. So then I became just as much of a new business person even though I had been in business for 18 years, it's, it, it was a, such a different thing that I was doing what all of you may do when you start to, to open, want to open a business. is you start Googling. It's like, how do, I, how do I get a barcode? How do I get a barcode to put on my label? What are the regulations for a label? And that's, it's changed so much with Google. Every, you do a lot of research online, but some one of the more important points is that you use the resources that are there for you. Because there's the Department of Agriculture has Utah Zone. I became a Utah Zone own member immediately, and then you have monthly meetings, and all of the business owners that are small companies gather together and share information. They'll tell you how they found the labels. They'll tell you how they, and then how about packing? Where, None of us want to go to that huge expense of going and buying packing equipment and buying big bottling. I mean, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars. So how do you do it? You don't make it in your kitchen, right? So what do you do? Well, there's things called co-packers, packing plants that are co-packers that just basically you sign a non-disclosure, give them their recipe, and they pack it for you under a, a licensed plant. And then you pay them a little markup, and then you sell it. So, but how did I learn that information? From Utah Zone, from other small companies. There's also, did you know that, I don't know if you have it here, maybe you could tell me at Snow College, but the department of um, the, the school up in Logan will evaluate your recipes and do the calorie count and pH balance all that for free as part of the student's training. So did you, you wouldn't have to go into that expense of hiring a food scientist. You don't have to hire a food scientist and go into the expense of finding out your label information as far as the protein, all the stuff that's required by law to have on there. You don't have to buy, hire a food scientist. 
you can send a sample to the Logan School, and they'll evaluate it and, as part of their classwork and send it back to you. So there are so many ways, and those same principles that I did as a restaurateur as far as not going into big expense apply to any business. You can go to, um, there's small business owners associations, there's specialty food association in Salt Lake. There's all kinds, and I know Utah Zone comes down this way and does seminars. So there's all kinds of information at your fingertips to glean information and to get what you need to open your business without going into huge expense. So then, so now that I had, um, you know, and I, you know, as a sushi chef, I have the, I'm different than a lot of other chefs because you're sitting right, the customers are sitting right in front of you, right? I'm not the Gordon Ramsay in the back swearing and throwing things and carrying on because you're out there in front in the restaurant on the main floor. So, but the customers are giving your feedback one on one as they're eating. And so I, I mean, and so you don't have it second or third hand. So I have an advantage there that I had talked to customers for 18 years, right? I had heard their feedback. And what a trend that I noticed while I was chefing is there was a pretty big contingency of people that are allergic to wheat, that are celiac, that come and eat sushi because sushi is rice and seaweed. There's no, there's no bread in it. So it's one of the few dinners they can go out to dinner at is celiac. So I had a pretty big group, so when I'm deciding to bottle my teriyaki sauce, I had a thought, well, maybe I should just make a teriyaki sauce for them, for those, that small customer base that I knew existed, that always asked me to make a specialty sauce. Can you make me something that's gluten-free? Can you make me these without regular soy sauce? Regular soy sauce has had wheat in it. So can you make me a sauce without that, without that regular soy sauce? So when I'm deciding to bottle the teriyaki sauce, I thought, well, why don't I make a special version for them? And then, you know, my mom's been diabetic for 20 years. Why don't I make a sugar-free version of the same sauce? And so it's just a thought based on experience, but then you walk through the grocery store, and you know what? I don't see any gluten-free teriyaki sauce. I don't see any sugar-free teriyaki sauce. So then I had decided that that was something that you found a need again that wasn't that didn't exist, and so I made that that decision to bottle those versions as well, and that panned out because that because there are a lot of different teriyaki sauces on the market, but because there aren't any gluten free and because there aren't any sugar free, the grocery stores want my line because it gives them the specialty. And yes, the, the main, the chef's blend, the main version is the most popular and what I sell most of, but that niche market gets me in the door. Finding that niche market that doesn't exist elsewhere got me in the door. So, bottled the sauce, and then it's like, well, how do you go about getting it on the store shelves? And that, maybe it was a little bit of my own naivete, but I just started pounding the pavement. Right? I just started going and visiting grocery stores. And I, I had my gallon, my, the big restaurant size teriyaki sauce, so I'd go visit chefs and say, do you want to not make your own sauce? How about this one? It's all natural. Give them the whole spiel. It's just ready to pour. It's all consistent. You know your price point. And then what I didn't know is that the, like all the grocery stores like local businesses. And they would just and slide stuff over and put my stuff on the shelf. I didn't know that there were schematics. Does anybody know what a schematic is? In the grocery store business, corporate decides a map of each shelf and exactly what goes in each line on each shelf. The, the, they were willing, each store manager that I went to was willing to ignore the schematic and slide me over and put it on. It's, it's, it wasn't that I was going against the grain on purpose. I didn't know. About, I didn't know about schematics. I just went knocking on doors back then asking to talk to the, the store managers. And they were kind enough to put it on. And then the first corporate I went to was Harmon's, which also loves local companies. They're, they're very supportive if you're a local business. And they, they put me on the schematic. And that's where I learned that there was such a thing. But they put me on the schematic and then they, they lined me up with a distributor of how are you going to get the sauce from your plant to each store. 
at the time, when I started out, I was just driving around with socks in my car and seeing if any store needed replacement. You know, I just kind of went and kids went to school, I went to a few stores, see if they need anything, looked at the shelves, and um, then starts the distribution aspect. And the distribution aspect is kind of a hard cart for the horse, kind of a weird transition. Because the distributors really won't take you on if you don't have a customer base. But how do you get a customer base if you can't get your product to the distributor, right? So it becomes this, so it becomes really, it's, a, it's a really a hard little push and pull. So what you do is you find some big, like it, for me it was Little America, loved my teriyaki sauce, and they're a big Nicholas company, right? So because Little America wanted the sauce, or because one of the colleges wanted the sauce, that kind of forced the distributor to carry it because I sold it to them, right? I sold it to Little America, and they said, I want this. So that's kind of how you work around that distribution problem. Because they, the, if you just went to make a call at the distributor, whether it be Nicholas Cisco, U.S. Foods, or if you're going to one of the, for your jars, Casey Foods, and one of the specialties, they'll come and say, well, what's your sell-through? And how do you have sell-through if you don't have a way to get it there? So you really kind of have to do it yourself and show that your product sells in order to get it into a distribution house. And that's kind of how I went about it. But you have to know and go. I have to realize that grocery stores are in business, right? They're going to mark up your product because they're in business as well. So they're going to mark it up 30% of what you sell it to them for. So when you look at that price and you're like, if I'm going to sell it to the grocery store for $5, they're going to sell it for $6.50. If I'm going to sell it to the grocery store for $3.50, they're going to sell it for $5. They're still in business, even though they're gracious and kind enough to put your product on the shelf, they are still in business. They still need to make money. So if you find when you're, if you get involved in the grocery store part and there's going to mark your product up too high that it's not going to sell, then you might want to start off in more doing farmer's markets or doing something where you're the direct seller. So you can package your product and take it to a farmer's market and sell it direct to the customer. So there's no markups in between there. It's just you direct to the purchaser. And then the, the whole profit is yours. But that helps you keep the price low until you build. And, and the advantage of going that route is that if, you're, if you need to tweak your product at, at all, you're now listening to your customer feedback one-on-one. -on -one. You see, I mean, you're at the, the, you're at the farmer's market. The customer's usually come to the farmer's market every Saturday and they say, oh, I like this, but I didn't like this part of it. So listen to them. Listen to what your customer has to say. And, and be open-minded enough not to just say, no, I know, I, I know what I want to do and this is mine. The customer really is the king. So listen to what they want. And that's, that would give you the advantages if you did do, if you did want to start off with the farmer's market approach, then you would have the direct seller and then build yourselves to where you now had more volume, so maybe you could produce it for less money, right? As you got more volume, you can make it cheaper, then you can go into the distribution. That's kind of the two different paths. So that's kind of my, um, my opinion on running a business, is follow your gut and listen to your customers. Take, take chances when chances come to you. And take chances, period. <laughs> so, so that's um. So now that I've I have started bottling still sama back in 2006, and then I worked hard doing all of the demos. So I would do in-store demos. If I sold it to a grocery store, I would say I would come, you know, just like the Costco where the grocery store come on Saturdays and give little samples out and sell, help them sell the product to prove that the market sells then they're more likely to put your product on the shelf if you're willing to back your product up, if you're willing to help them sell the product. So I, I did demos every, every Friday night and Saturday and, and built it to where I, now I'm in the distributors and the distributors buy it. And I really kind of just do paperwork because the production plant 
produces my sauce. It's my recipe. The, produce, the production plant produces my sauce. The distributors pick up the sauce from the production plant, and I sell it, but I don't ever touch it. See, so it kind of builds to that point, where I never really touch the sauce because the distributors pick it up from the plants that are producing it. So I do gallons for a restaurant that are, that's in all three distributors, and I do jars for grocery stores that's produced in Chicago, where KB, the specialty food distributor, is. So I found, I made the move to find a packing plant that was close to the distributor so that they would pick it up, so that I wouldn't have to arrange trucking, and I wouldn't have to pay for trucking. They would pick it up from the plant. So I changed where it was produced, according to my distributor. And you can have your sauce, or whatever you're doing, produced in 10 different spots, in two, 10 different co-packers. You don't have to limit it to one. You can have it produced in lots of different co-packers, depending on your needs. So that's, um, so still Sama is still for sale. I mean, it's still selling. <laughs> Not for sale as the business, but it's still selling the sauce. And then last year, I received a phone call to, um, as to offer me a partnership if I would come back into making sushi. So this, I mean, so this January, in January, my kids are now 17 and 20. They don't care if they don't see me every night anymore. <laughs> and they, um, and so now I'm back in the restaurant business again. So it's kind of like life goes full circle. And I, you know, at first when they called and offered me, I went, hell no, I know how many hours of restaurant work is. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. I mean, I just, I kept, I kept gnawing on me, so that's when I knew that that was what, where my heart was. That I had to follow yet again, follow your heart, follow that path in the road. And so I'm back chefing again and enjoying it, and back talking to customers every night and cutting fish. So that's the full story of, of my two different entrepreneurs, both the chefing and, and sauce. And now I'll open it if anyone has any questions. Yes? How did I find someone to do, produce my product? Um, it was the same as, I mean, when I first um, was questioned, I went to Utah Zone and found, but it, I mean, I can tell you that the production plants in Salt Lake that produce product, depending on what it is. Because a lot of times when you're talking to other, to other companies, you find a company that's a light product. Like if it's a popcorn, you find someone that's making popcorn where they're packing it so that you find a plant that does that kind of thing. And since mine is a sauce, then I found both packaging in West Jordan that bottle sauces. And they, I mean, they have their own line they bottle, but then they bottle 10 other companies because they have all the big equipment. And they just want to keep their, packing plants want to keep their equipment running at all times, right? That's what helps them pay for all that big equipment. So they actually want companies to come to them. They want to produce your product because that keeps their equipment paying for itself. Granted, they don't make the same percentage. They do a, 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 a sorry, a packing our product as they do their own, but they still make money. Their machines are still making money, right? So they are trying to get as many companies packing there as possible. So they're open to it. So you look for a company, and a lot of times, um, now, all the grocery stores have the Utah Zone or Made in Utah stickers, usually the flag. I would look on the back and just look where that company that's like-minded or like product is produced and call them. I mean, we're, we're very open to sharing information. It's not a secretive thing that I have found anyway. Everyone's extremely open to sharing information because we were all there. We, we've all been in that, in that research of I don't even know what to do. So just look for a product that's like that. Uh -huh. But you were able to find the packing plant then? Yeah, but I don't just do what I found. And I know there's got to be somebody else. 
I know Chef Tom would be the one. Chef Tom um, has a spice line and uh, would, would do it. I would contact Chef Tom. So that, I mean, I would contact just because it's a light product. But he, I mean, and then just make sure you have him sign a non disclosure so he doesn't take the recipes, right? You don't, you have him, you always take a non disclosure to the packing plant so that your recipes are secure and have that signed. But then, um, but I would definitely contact him because I know it's like product. Yes. Well, I'm curious for you to tell a little bit about what have you had to do once it's in the store in terms of marketing to get people to actually buy it? I mean, some huge brands have a lot of marketing customers. A lot of marketing money, yeah. A lot of, uh, and a lot of companies pay for that slotting, right? If you go to Kraft, Kraft pays for that slot on the grocery store shelf. At the tune of thirty thousand dollars a unit. I mean, some of those big stores pay for space on the grocery store shelf. But as little guys, main the main marketing that the grocery stores will want and expect is demos, because demos do sell product. That I mean, and so if you are willing to say, I will go, I will go to your store and stand there and hand out samples and. Make sure it's a sample that tastes good. I mean, right? I mean, you want. I mean, if it's your spice, make sure it's on a on a spice piece of chicken or spice something, not just the taste of the spice, something that people will eat. And then, if you're willing to support it, because usually, like if I go do a demo in a grocery store, and usually they you they expect four hours, just so you know, four four to five hours, but usually four hours they'll be happy. But for the most part, I'll stand, sell ten cases of sauce during that four hours. So it's just, I mean, you give them a taste, you give them their spill, the customer goes, oh, I never tried it, and they take a jar off your table. And then make sure you have this, your product there at the table ready for them to take, right? I mean, you don't want to send them, it's over in aisle three, you know, on the top shelf. Don't send them, look, you, they'll forget. Have, right? have your product right there on the table in front, so when, after they taste it, it's just immediate, and they put it in their cart. But yeah, I mean, what I have found, I mean, because I didn't do, I did some marketing. I mean, and, and I have that advantage also of being the chef. So I've done a lot of guest cooking shows and a lot of guest cooking where I use, oh, what? I'm looking still, still looking, I'm using still salmon teriyaki, right? I, look at what you can make with still salmon teriyaki, right? I mean, I, I have an advantage there, granted. But I have found the most useful is doing in-store demos. And that's what they'll really be looking for. I know that going into it, that you offer the demos. Yeah. Uh-huh. And the spice that I use will be a month. Right. And we've done the demos that we've talked about. So I've never found one that's done the spice four hours. Oh, is that right? You've never found a company that's used to four hours? No, that I've done it for a demo for a day. They want all day. Well, and when I, I mean, in every one that I have set up, I've always said I'll be there. And when we do a Utah Zone, I don't know if you've joined Utah Zone, but when we do a Utah Zone um, party demo, basically, is when they'll have a Utah Zone event where 20 different companies will go to the same store and demo. They're usually set up for four to five hours. I mean, that's what the store is, has asked. So I would negotiate with them because longer than that, you get pretty damn tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that, well, you have to know that when you own your own business, you work. Yeah. Yeah. You work lots of hours. But having the demos sold more product than without them, right? Demos is really the marketing that, that does it. Because it gets them to taste the product or to try the product. You mentioned being tired and you talked about long hours. Can you tell us what, what has been the most difficult or disappointing hard thing about having your business? And then maybe the most important thing. The, the, thing I, the, the thing that I have enjoyed the most and the things that have been most difficult for me as a business owner, um, what I've enjoyed the most is watching the customer's response to liking my product. I mean, there's, I mean it's, it's like when, when, the, when I'm demoing the teriyaki sauce and they taste it and they take three steps and look back, you know you got them, right? <laughs> you know you hooked them because they, they took, 
they thought they were just having a little snack, right? They were just having a little snack, and then they took three steps away, and like, wait, I like this. And then they come back, that's satisfying, right? And for, as a sushi chef, when you, when you make it, they say, make me something special, and you see their eyes light up. I like that. I mean, that's part of, that's just so ingrained in my personality. I guess I'm a people pleaser to the max, right? Because I really like seeing that customer response to liking my product. And the hardest has been, um, you know, the, the stupid, I mean, the, the, the big one that stands out is like, Right after I opened up Ichiban Sushi, I was sharpening. Back then, I was really good. I was, I was really diligent. And I sharpened my knives every night at the end of the shift, right? So I was sharpening my knives, making sure they were clean. And I had them on the counter. And a waitress was walking by and bumped the handle of the knife. And I saw it out of the corner of my eye, my knife falling. And without even thinking, I grabbed it. And I caught it. But I caught it by the blade. Right? And I, I mean, and as you, if any of you know how sharp, having just been sharpened, but sushi knives are extremely sharp. And I cut like four or five fingers to the bone. I mean, it was a mess, and that's my livelihood. So you always have that part of it, that there's, there's still injuries. You're still handing a knife. So every time now, if I see something falling, I jump back. Right? I, move out of the, I move out of the way, and my hands are in the air. That you move out and keep your hands away because, um, but I mean, I and I just uh, three weeks ago, I had seven stitches on my finger, and who would who would have thought? I mean, I've been making sushi for thirty years. Why am I still cutting my hand? <laughs> but I'm still holding a knife for twelve hours a day. It's bound to happen, and you have to just kind of roll with the punches of that. Still, you're still going to have downfall. You're still going to have cut sometimes, you're still going to have tired feet sometimes, and you're still going to have, you know, you, you still have to paste a smile on if you really you are tired and don't feel like talking to people, you still have to. That's your job, right? So you, you kind of have to roll with the downfalls as well as well as the upfalls of seeing people happy. That's what we like, people happy. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I used to work for a small company, a firm manufacturer. They are gold. But I'm seeing a different strategy from what you did and what they did. And what's the different strategy from what they did and I did? So what they're doing, they've been open for two years. Uh -huh. I see that they could be so much bigger than they actually are currently. But they're not letting the co-packers, they're not, they're not distributing the way they should. They're still trying to make it themselves and trying to sell it at shows, boutiques. But they do have a unique product in the fact that everything is local from Utah, including dairy, everything. And they specialize in 30 different kinds with real foods, real nuts. But they may have made that decision as a price point decision, which we, I mean, we don't know if it's because they're making it and distributing it in the self to make it so that it's a price point people will buy. Because once you get distributors and stores in there, you, you give them a percentage. So that's the, that's the part of the information you, we may or may not know why they're making that decision, right? But if it's more that they, they think that, I mean, because that's still, like I said, you start out without incurring a lot of debt, and you start out building your business, but they might be ready to take that next step, and they just don't know how, right? Because they may now have enough sales in the boutique area, and they may now have enough sales and proven their product is desirable, but now it is time to find a co-packer and move on. They just haven't taken that next step, which probably they should look at. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of where it's, we don't, not knowing their numbers, it might be just one of either numbers or it might be one of unknown that they just don't know to do it, right? Right? Yes? Uh -huh. With the flyers there, I have those on on any table I do demo, or like at the state fair, I did a booth at the state fair, or I have those anywhere. More of something to show people the ca the calorie or the nutritional information, and um, to take away so that it it in brand, it's a branding so that they recognize the product name, and they see that picture and go, oh, I like that. I mean, so I always have some kind of the picture of the sauce and the jars so that they can keep that 
and remember. Is this the only time you can do this? Uh-huh. Yeah. It's just, it's just a little takeaway for them to carry something with them. Anybody else? Yes, in the back. What's your favorite kind of sushi that goes with your sauce? <laughs> My favorite kind of sushi that goes with the sauce? Yeah. Well, that, that, I mean, so usually the sauce is for cooked food, but I have made salmon teriyaki sushi that's pretty good. Would you make me some? Sure. <laughs> you know, I happen to bring up. <laughs> I have rice with me. No. <laughs> well, I thought sauce. about it for a minute, but I didn't know how, you know, if we could serve at this many that quickly, but... But, um, yeah, so the salmon teriyaki is a good bet. Or, I mean, really, the teriyaki sauce really goes with any meat. See, now you're going to get my spill. Ready for my spill? All natural, no preservatives, no peach, no... <laughs> no, I mean, and it's, and, and it's used on pork, beef, chicken, fish, anything. Yes? Okay, so just one more thing. I'm Hispanic, so would it go well with carne asada? Sure. So I'll try it. Thank yeah, you. but, yeah, I mean... Um, pulled pork teriyaki is the bomb diggity. It is. It is. With a little sauteed onions as a sandwich. Yum. A whole lot of yum. Yes. Well, and that, I mean, that comes from, it's kind of like the, the phone line, right? If you go to one meeting, they'll tell you and talk about the next meeting of a different association. We share information. I really promise you, I think the companies here within Utah help each other. And it's the same, if you ask me, I mean, I'm kind of an open book, I'll tell you where, what co-packers I know, I'll tell you what labeling tools I know. Oh, and that's the other thing I forgot to do, if you have your labels ready, and you turn into the Department of Agriculture, they review them and tell you if you got everything right. The Department of Ag does a label review and doesn't charge you. They have a person just to do label reviews, they know all the laws of what your, your point of the line has to be and what information you have to on the label. So why not use Department of Agriculture? I mean, there's so many of those kind of, but I mean, if, if you go to a Utah Zone meeting, then they'll tell you about the Specialty Foods Association. You go to the Specialty Foods Association, and they'll tell you about the local zone. I mean, everybody kind of shares. It's like, oh, are you going to that tomorrow? Or if there's a gluten-free um, event at Harmon. Then you know anybody that has anything to do with gluten free is there, and then it's like, oh, did you know there's a, a gluten free expo next week? No, I didn't know that. We all share. And, and, and then just be the same, reciprocate. When you have information and somebody asks you, share. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of how it works in this community in Utah. We share. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, thanks for having me here. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Peggy. So approachable, so willing to, as you said, share your ideas. We appreciate your generosity in coming here today. Thank you, and we'll see you next week.